Um, apologies for absence, Chris. We have apologies from concern. Thank you. Right, thank you. Uh, and has everybody read the minutes of the last meeting of the House of Wales Legal Review scrutiny held on the 2nd of May? So just to be confirmed as a true record. Move acceptance, Chair. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Moved. Um, can I remind members of the disclosures of members' interests and participation? Okay, none. Yeah. Right, we're going to screen on to the primary care applications working group. And this is just to approve the terms of the reference, which Chris has changed around a bit. So, do you want to explain it a bit more, Chris, or is everybody yeah. happy to accept it? The, the changes to the terms of reference are really small. It's just taking out um, the CCGs because they no longer exist and replacing any reference between CCGs with ICBs. Um, and we've also included a standing invite to help watch for that working group and um, help watch Auckland and share really in great insight into what um, some of the community is thinking. Mm -hmm. And so we thought it would be a good idea to offer them a standing invite. So that's included on the terms of reference as well. Um, but those are the only two changes. So that's to, just to approve the terms of the reference. So everybody agree the terms? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Uh, the health and wellbeing board, the minister. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, to approve the um, membership just to, st to stay as they are. Does everybody agree with that? I, would, I think it was uh, Councillor Bowman, Councillor Hunter. Yeah. No, so, and it's the chair. They didn't I'll be the chair. The chair of health as well. Chair of council screen, who whoever that's going to be. Okay. I'm happy to remain as a member, Chair. Thank you. Uh, the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, just to know there, has everybody had a chance to read them? Noted, no, Chair. Thank you. Uh, the next one is reports to the Cabinet Member for caring for adults. This is all to, um, Alan Curry. Um, and he wants to swap this around a bit, so it's over to you, Alan, to look through that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Alan Curry. I'm um, head of commissioning in adult services. Apologies from Neil, he couldn't be here today. Uh, there are two reports from me on the agenda, and if it's okay, I'll just change the order of them slightly. They're both about the social care market, um, and they're about the difficulties in the, in the social care market. If I can do the, the one first, which is the an, an update on pressures in adult home care first. Uh, it would make sense that uh, the report on contingencies follows on, on from that one. Uh, so I, I think this fell out of discussions at the, the last committee meeting about pressures in home care services in, in particular. So we've noticed them um, in Northumberland probably two years now. Um, we've had real pressure in the home care system and it manifests itself in us not to get sufficient care services for the demand that we've got from people in the community. It's mostly a service that's delivered to older people with disabilities and medical conditions in, in their own homes. So since the summer of 2021, we've been unable to get sufficient numbers of care packages to meet everybody's needs. And since that time, we've had around about 200 to 220 people where we've not been able to get the, either the full package of care that they need or any package of care that they need. So they've been looked after perhaps by relatives. Um, they might have smaller care packages in than they actually need. They may be in a care home. Uh, or they may be um, stuck in hospital as well and unable to get returned home. Um, so we've seen that number fairly consistently for, for two years. This this isn't a problem just for Northumberland, it's a national issue and one faced by our neighbouring local authorities uh, as well. It's a problem up and down the country that there's insufficient um, care and it results from us not being able to attract enough people into the into that part of the social care workforce. Uh, ironically, as I've come to this committee, we have seen some slight improvements in the situation since April of this year. So whilst I've said we've operated with about 200, 200 to 220 people on a, a, a list of what we call the outstanding list, 
as of last Friday, it was actually down to 135, and we've seen it drop from um, from April onwards. Now, I couldn't say that that was the result of sudden turns in, in recruitment and retention within that sector. I think there's several things contributed to it that we don't we haven't had the chance to fully unpick yet until we get the data there. But there are a number of different factors. We've got some providers who've joined our contract arrangements who are recruiting from abroad. They've been able to pick up some new packages, so that's helped to some extent. We're going into summertime, so sometimes you know that there might be some slight improvements in recruitment and retention as well. But I couldn't say that that is a permanent reversal of the, the difficulties that we've got. Um, our neighbours have reported similar things as well. So uh, spoken to North colleagues in North Townside and Gates said who, who said the same pattern was following in, in their areas as well. But um, we don't have any providers who said this suddenly had an influx of staff. And I think that is the root of the problem that we've got here. And, and until we can start to see increases of the num in the number of people who want to work in home care, we will still be describing a problem situation. Um, in terms of the, the providers that we've got in Northumberland, we contract with about 50 providers. They're all different shapes and sizes. Uh, the largest employs about 370 staff. Uh, and there'll be some very small ones that are, that just employ a handful of staff. They they really are very different, and that suits us in Northumberland. Uh, we couldn't have a, a provider with a such a big workforce in some of the rural areas. There wouldn't be enough work for them. Um, so it, it suits us to have a real mixed market of providers. Um, we've got this difficulty typically before we we hit the. The problems that we've seen since 2021, we would often operate with a small list of people for whom we couldn't source home care. But if that ever reached about 40 to 50 people, we would consider that a serious situation. So we've been far in excess of that for, for the last two years. We've tried um, several things to, to try and resolve the difficulties in Morpeth, in Northumberland as a, as a whole. Um, We've had some central government measures, we've had some local NHS measures, and, and we've had some um, council-backed measures as well. Some of them have been aimed at um, providing retention bonuses to staff. So if they stayed in employment for a certain length of time, typically till the end of the, the difficult winter period, they were paid a bonus for that. Uh, the council made a decision in January 2021 to link the increase in the contracted rate in this sector to providers paying the real living wage, a national living wage. That was a, a significant step by the council, but unfortunately it coincided with um, changes in cost of living and any financial benefits that I think the staff would have experienced in that sector from April of last year were perhaps overshadowed by other things going on in terms of energy costs and fuel costs and all sorts of things. Um, and we've got um, a, a long list of quite practical steps that we've supported providers with. I think they're paragraph 12.7 in the report as well. So links with job centres, helps with job fairs, helps help to advertise posts for these providers have, have all been and will continue to be offered by us as council officers as well. But I think at Paragraph 1210, um, given the best data that we've got, uh, that illustrates the problem, which is a shrinking workforce in the council's contracted uh, home care services. So in April 2021, we think there were 1,553 workers uh, amongst our contracted providers. The equivalent figure for March 2023 was 1,317. So you can see a significant drop in the size of the, the workforce there. Um, Paris 13 and 13.4 and gives some details there just on the, the numbers of people that we support in home care services. And we can't see any dramatic increase in demand that would have led to the difficulties that we're getting in picking up um, home care packages, so we're, we're quite clear it's a, it's a workforce issue. We've got some other, other plans that we 
just implementing um, as we speak this afternoon. So the council has an allocation of the market sustainability and improvement fund of 3.56 million for this year. And that's been significantly targeted at home care services with a couple of different measures. And the first one was introduced on the 1st of July. And so a, a new one where we have again offered our um, home care providers an increase in their fee rates if they commit contractually to paying their staff at least £12 per hour. So that's a significant step that we, we've taken again to try and um, recruit and, and retain more people in, in that sector. We've got more measures planned for the beginning of October as well, but we're in consultation with our providers about what we what we think and what they think would actually help resolve this. Pound per hour is a, is a big step, and it's more than one pound fifty an hour above the real um, the, the night number than wage figure, which is ten pounds forty two an hour. Um, we. As I say, we've got further measures planned for um, later in the, in this year, but until we can turn around that workforce issue, I think we'll still continue to face um, problems that's, that we're, we're seeing. Um, 135 people still without home care package is an improvement on where we were back in March, but it's still a significant issue for us. That's far too many people that were unable to, to source home care for. And we'll be monitoring carefully the, the impact of the, the measures that we take. That's what I wanted to cover and summarise in the first one. I don't know whether you want me to go on to the second one or ask questions at, at this stage. I'm, I'm happy with questions now. Yeah. Uh, well, I've got Councillor Hill and then Councillor Dodds, Councillor Hunter and Councillor, I can't remember your last name. Hardy, thank you. Hardy. Me on, thank you. It, it seems to me, talking about this problem, and we're not we're talking about the problem in London, but be equally valid if I was talking about anywhere in the country. We've got a problem here, and it's only going to get worse because of various factors: the state of the economy, cost of living, elderly population, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and we're nowhere near finding a solution. And when you're talking about, because I mean, the problem is within the sector, it's seen, it's an un, seen as an unskilled job, which it isn't, and it's therefore completely underpaid. So when you're talking about, you know, another £1.50 per hour, I mean, we're nowhere near the sort of levels we should be paying. I mean, you, as, as a start of a 10, you'd be at least talking about double. And if, you, if we keep thinking and fitting around, like another £1.50 an hour, we're competing with people who are working in burger bars, salaries and things, I think it's just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And we've got to think much more radically. This is situation going to get worse until we sit and look. You know, normally you look at pay and you think, you know, you increase 5%, 10%, or whatever. We're just totally on the wrong planet on this. They're just simply not paid anywhere near enough. Nowhere near. And we, I don't know if we can be the trailblazers to this, but unless you pay carers, I mean, you charge enough, you're just getting all the money. <laughs> Cost of fortune for people to get home care, and these people pay pittance. So we need to be much more radical, you know, double at least what they're currently being paid, or we're going to get nowhere. And we're going to have a growing crisis. It's as simple as that. And so, don't. I think Dublin the salary is is a bit irresponsible at this moment in time. Well, it's sort of kept crisis. Though. Well, however, it is that you know this problem has been around a while. Sectors and I mean, here farm workers of one who stack shelves in supermarkets. You hear of wagon drivers stacking shelves in supermarkets, you know, they're paying a lot more than rates are. However, our job is to monitor what this is. So, can I suggest that we do, you know, do you said the numbers are coming down, but they were from a very high place. You know, that we do draw a line, see, this month and check it in six months where we are. Otherwise, we will have to, I wouldn't say double the salary, but we're going to, because money, I know it's like in the cabinet, you've got to fight for money. You know, it's not going to happen. So we, we've got to, we've got to put the case that 
if there's no improvement in six months, 12 months, we've then got to say you've got to find some more money. Now, I presume every other authority is going through the same head scratching as what we're going to do, trying to find out a, a solution to get people into jobs. I mean, I even heard yesterday that the Northeast unemployment rate was down to 3%, which is quite good of. So uh, I, I don't know. I think we need to draw a line and say, what's it like six and 12 months? Okay. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, is it is there pockets across the county that's got bigger problems than others? Because 135 families or people, you know, that's terrible for them. Because if you're the person that's waiting on care, I was wondering on that. And is the rurals worse than others? Um, because again, the cost of living is coming in, and yeah, we may increase the wage to twelve pound, but fuel's going up, other costs are going up, so therefore it eats away at what you're getting. And also, is the workforce ageing? I'm not against ageism, but I'm thinking is if we're not getting younger people coming in at the bottom, the situation is never going to improve because people get to a certain time in life and they say, I'm going to retire. And then we could lose a lot that's actually there and make the situation even worse than what we are. Okay. Should I respond? Yeah. And um, so traditionally, the the problems have always been worse in the more rural areas because there are fewer staff and the distance between calls to people's houses tends to be longer as well so there's more travel time than there is um, service delivery um so the west and the north of northumberland are generally particularly more difficult to deliver home care in the workforce is aging um and we are talking to providers about how we could uh, improve the image of it, improve the terms and conditions under which they're employed, as well as look at salary and look at things like uh, how they travel and how they pay for cars. If you're a younger person with higher insurance premiums, for example, and uh, trying to get a, a car and work in home care and pay for those travel costs, um, it, providers are telling us that, that that is a difficult step to take. So as well as looking at the salaries, I think that's important. I think it's important what we've done with the salaries, but we've got a, a period now between July and the beginning of October to see how how things change. Hopefully we'll make some progress still. And then we've got the next tranche of um, measures that we can bring in from October and then look at where we go. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Councillor Hardy. A, a, a couple of issues. Um, the provision of care and the shortfall and the provision of care, in my personal experience, has been a major problem since 2013. We could not get a care package for my sister. And that is not uncommon. But to help address that, we use outside services that are privately funded or funded by grants from charities. But we in ourselves do not give a carer's assessment to the relatives of the people that are left just to get on with it. Will we be giving carer's assessments to the people members of the family that are left to just get on with. Yeah. So the, um, as I said, when I was going through the reports, the people who were unable to source home care for could be at home being looked after by family, relative carers or, or friends without professional service going in. So we are monitoring those people and doing welfare checks <coughs> on them and they should be offered carers assessments as well if that's placing um, strains on the carers. Some people are in um, older person's care homes because we can't source the package. Others have got some degree of home care going in but not the full, the full extent but we are monitoring those people who we can't get care for. If, if I mean again in my experience and I work with motor neuron disease so I'll put that on the, the table straight away. The people that require the most assistance are least likely to get any form of health package. And carer assessment must be a priority 
in my opinion. Thank you for that. Um, I've got Councillor Bowman. Thank you for the report. Um, it is interesting reading, and I understand that since 2013, the situation has increasingly got worse, as it were. I can see in the report that uh, the care sector is struggling. Um, there's, there's a lot of talk about revamping the whole sector, uh, looking at it afresh and moving on and to change it and uh, to link up with the NHS. Uh, I come to some of the conclusions in your report and uh, in chapter well, 15.2, you talk about an academy as a means of uh, recruitment, setting up uh, an academy with the NHS, working jointly to uh, bring about care workers, fully trained, with the aspects of moving into the sector and uh, providing care to our residents. Um, are you looking into that uh, with urgency? Is that something that we are taking on board now? Are you in conversations with the NHS? And when we talk about uh, the financial side of the, the salaries of care workers, uh, could you find out what the NHS would think would be a, an equivalent rate uh, in their structure? And could we have a look at see what they would think in their structure would be acceptable uh, for care workers? Um, so I know that uh, some years ago there was a, a joint working group with, the, with this council and the NHS, and that was torn up, um, which was unfortunate. But can we go back to looking at the NHS and working jointly with them? Uh, I'm sure that uh, an academy is a good idea, and there is the potential to cross borders, as it were, between the NHS and come to us, and the other way as well. It could be this marriage again uh, on the staffing level. Uh, is that a possibility? So we are we are looking at uh, care academies. I think there's about half of the local authorities in the northeast are operating an, a, a care academy. They differ. Um, you know that they, they are all resourced quite differently, and the, and the, the offer is slightly different. <laughs> we are talking to our NHS um, colleagues about it as well, because they've got an interest in uh, setting one up in the Northumbria area, so that covers North Tyneside and Northumberland. Um, we're talking to them next time I talk to them about it will be Friday of, of this week again. So we having serious conversations about either doing it with them or separately, but doing, you know, making sure that we're in dialogue with them. So the, the Care Academy for me would be something that offers some of the measures that we've already started to support providers with. So um, we support them with job fairs. Um, with publicity, um, we, we hosted job fairs in, in County Hall and other county buildings as well, which have been successful. We try to promote the image of working in social care. The academy would look at things like training, so it's not just about recruiting new people in, but trying to keep hold of the people who are already working in social care, so perhaps supporting them to be able to make a career of it and progress within that career, making sure those pathways are all uh, all in existence as well. So we are seriously looking at it. Um, whether it's set, set up as a formal academy or, or not, um, I'm not sure yet. It, it gives it a badge and it gives it something to hang on to and something from a, for us to market. Um, but we're already doing some of the, those same measures um, that an academy would undertake. I mean, it's a chance to do them at a much bigger scale. But in summary, yes, we, we're talking about the academy seriously and with the NHS as well. Uh, Chair, with your permission, can we ask for a report? With your permission, Chair, can we ask for a report in the future about uh, the academy? Yeah, yeah, that's what we do. 
Yeah, I think the partnership with the NHS was uh, a highly successful one. It wasn't us backed out of it. It was the NHS. So, um, and it was a great cost for us to, to do that and to set something else up. So I'm not in favour of going back there unless they're prepared to come forward. Yeah. Well, what, what, what kind of bonus was I going to say? Just the report on the academy that it's working. Well, he said it's teacher report. Yeah. But the report, if what he wants to bring back is about the academy, it's not about the NHS. Mm -hmm. I think that was just a statement he made, comment he made. Okay. Right. The only thing I want to say, and I, I, sorry, can I, Yes, too. Thank you. Just to um, compliment um, Alan's um, reference to the Care Academy, you may well be familiar with the LA7 and the devolution work that's, that's taken place. One area of work in there is pu public sector reform, and that's very much looking at the health and social care workforce at scale, because some of the issues that we have, and, and please correct me, um, Alan, if, if I'm wrong, around pay and conditions is that a lot of providers cross boundary, so we can't always necessarily just look to uplift our wages within Northumberland because as an overarching provider if they then also work into Newcastle and they don't do the same then as an organisation it disrupts that local workforce for that particular provider so whilst we're really keen to look at what we can do in Northumberland there's some things that were stronger panning out and looking at that LA7 footprint as that comes forward so in relation to the, the academy it may well be a broader piece of work around the public sector reform potentially yeah. Alan? That's a valid point and um what we expect, and as well as the cross-border issue existing around academies, it certainly does around the um, the providers' acceptance of the contract rate as well. So those providers that might have a base in Newcastle and deliver in Newcastle might not be able to accept our offer of increased fees and to pay their staff the £12 per hour because actually <coughs> most of their work is in Newcastle, maybe in Northumberland as well. but. Um, you know, they have to work out whether it's viable for them to do that. So cross border works for sure. Can I ask Chair, do you agree, would you say as a collective we really need to look at payment structure rather not just a pound here or there, but something much more realistic and will tackle the problem? As I understand what you're saying, it has to be collective, but will you help make that case? I think that's colleagues. part of the devolution conversation that's happening around how do we mobilise our workforce to be fit for the for, for now and the future, and that is that appreciation of our ageing population and, and that shift to being a more attractive profession for people to come into, so I think that's part of the, the marketing and the branding and looking at what the terms and conditions are, but as Alan touched on, it's not only salary necessarily, it's, all, it's also the conditions, so looking at travel expenses and that broader piece of work that can be the, the um, enticer into this um, sector beyond purely pay alone. There's, there's also the problem there of um, the staffing, if you're unemployed, because if, um, the care profession is a, it's in inconvenient hours, mm -hmm. the word. And sometimes they're sitting, and we just talked about this, they're sitting about a couple of hours sometimes waiting to go to see the next client. And if the restructure of, of the care and profession could be like in shifts type type of thing, you know, six or two to ten or something like that, or in between, you might get a better chance of, of employment because I think it's about it's about that because they're going in first thing in the morning, they might do another two or three clients, and then they've got about an hour or something. They can't really do anything at all. In that time, so it's that way to go on. But if you could restructure the timings, it might be a better solution or, or a shift pattern, which might suit a lot of people better. Oh, sorry, still not. If I may, following on from the point that you've just brought out, time constraints, that's a major factor. One of the other factors is when a carer arrives in someone's res residence where there is not the equipment in place that they need because whatever hold up there is in the system of getting that much needed equipment installed or provided the carer is not allowed to care 
for that person, but turning up, finding out that there's not a hoist or a wet room or a lift or a piece of equipment that they need, and they have been having to leave without providing any care whatsoever. And that is not acceptable, and I'm sorry, but it is not. It's, it's only that I'm mean, a really good report, but we look at the, the other things that do, do, do you know, do that. Can we move on? And, uh, yeah, it? so then the second report is about contingencies and what our plans and management arrangements are if, if we had uh, what we would call a market failure. So if for some reason a provider had to leave the market, um, how would you manage and deal that? And, and keep everybody safe and meet their, their care needs. I think the first thing to say is that if it is something that is more feasible, uh, again, in the home care sector, so the, the report concentrates a little bit more on the home care sector, but obviously I've touched on uh, older persons care homes as well. We've got experience of managing provider failure in both of those markets, and, and actually because there are people who come and go from the care market, organisations that come and go from the care market, we have got experience of, of managing that. So, for example, in, in the two and a bit years between January 21 and April 23, uh, we had, I think it was about seven providers, sorry, I just checked my report there, um, yeah, who, who left the market. That impacted on 69 service users and what we invariably done in all of those cases is try to make sure there's there's a smooth transition and that the service users move from one care operator to another. The contract requires that we do that in a particular way, so we have to make sure we're compliant with the contract. But we also try and make sure that staff can transfer as well. Given the shortages of staff, we want to try and keep as many people as we can working in the, in the care sector, so we do try and make sure they are fixed up with a with a new employer. But that's something that we've, we've worked on fairly regularly and, and, and managed uh, on small scales. And, and it, you know, it's a difficult transition for individuals receiving a, a different provider, but we help them through that process as well. Where it has been more difficult, we had one uh, example, which was back in 2017, where um, the contract arrangements with a large provider with 120 staff and 330 service users left our mark, yeah. our care market. That was a much more difficult situation to, to manage and partly because we had to transfer the staff and the, and the service users, but the systems and processes such as Rotring uh, were poor, that, that provider had poor practices and effectively we were transferring those poor practices practices across to another organisation. So we learned a lot from that back in 2017. We've both did the, uh, the team who, who monitors contracts and monitors quality in services so we can spot those kind of problems much earlier and, and fix them before they become um, too difficult to transfer across. So ordinarily, you know, the, that process of transfer and small scale contracts between providers happens fairly regularly. And, and it goes smoothly. If something happened to a large provider, it would be more difficult to manage, but I think we're in a, a good place now with our contract monitoring system to spot it early and prevent it from becoming uh, such a, a serious issue for us. Uh, in terms of the older person's care homes, again, we have people coming and going from that market. Uh, we're up to 71 older person's care homes in Northumberland at the moment, we've been down at times to 69 and we've had a, a couple more open in, in recent years. Some have closed as, as well. Um, again, that's difficult for people to move from an established care home and completely up and move somewhere else. But we've got enough capacity in that market for people to be able to do it and hopefully have some choice of where they're going to. And we've got skills in our social work teams and in our provider teams to make that as smooth as it, as it possibly could be. And we've got capacity in both the residential and the nursing sector to be able to um, to take new entrants into, into other homes as well. So if the, if the worst happens, 
and a provider decides to exit the market, we've, we've got experience of managing that. And, and as I say, we, we do that on a fairly regular basis. Um, and hopefully, you know, the measures that we talked about earlier will make that provider failure um, less, less likely, but um, if it happens, we, we do deal with it, as I say, and have managed it. Is there any questions? Any questions? Thank you for your report. Um, my understanding is that uh, when things go wrong, uh, the provider uh, shuts up shop, as it were. Um, you have the responsibility, don't you, to take on um, the situation and, in your words, you you classed it as transfer the service in-house. Um, and obviously you reported that uh, you uh, look for other providers, uh, you uh, transfer the individuals to other schemes. But if the situation continues like this, would we have a look at in-house being the norm as it were? where Northumberland County Council actually are the providers and not other organisations, would that be feasible? Or, or is that, uh, as you state in your report, uh, there are problems with that in the sense of financial uh, problems, as it were, a burden onto the council? Or what's your take on that? So at the, at the moment, we've got a situation where our, our home care is offered through largely through external contracts with 50 providers and work well. There, there's a lot of expertise amongst those providers. So if we had a, a market failure, I would expect them to be able to pick that work up and deliver it to, to quality, to a high quality. Um, I think I've referenced the CQC ratings of those providers who've got a registration in Northumberland and a high proportion of those are either good or outstanding rated by CQC. So I think we've got a good market and some good quality providers out there. But if we got ourselves into a situation where we, we couldn't transfer work across to an independent provider, then we would look to do it in-house. But within the report, I spelled out a financial risk to doing that because we would have to offer staff transferring into the council membership of the local government pension scheme, uh, which is um, you know, a very generous scheme, but probably more generous than the ones that the independent sector providers are, are operating on at the moment. So there, there would be a cost to that. Um, we do have a, a home care service that's offered by the council. It's a specialist reablement one that tries to help people um, following hospital discharge to recover and um, be able to do the things that they were once able to do again so that they no longer need a, a care provider. So we've got some expertise, we've got some good managers of that service. It is higher cost than doing it out in the independent sector. Um, so we would have to we would have to look at what the financial impact of that was, was going to be. But I do think that we've got a good market of home care and providers out there as well who could deliver those services as well. Can I just follow on from that, Chair? Um, we talked earlier about the um, wages of uh, care workers. Um, you uh, mentioned about uh, pension packages, if uh, it was to come in-house. Is that something we should be looking at as well in the uh, in the private sector? Like let's, uh, the contracted sector, as it were, should we be looking at that as well? We're talking about trying to enhance um, the pay packages and those. It's not a financial uh, bonus now, but it is in years to come when they retire from a fantastic uh, job, as it were. Um, so it's something to look forward to. Uh, so what's good for um, officers and uh, staff within Northumberland County Council. Why can't that be just the same? It's good for the staff and uh, those working in the care sector. 
that uh, are contracted to us. Can we arrange something in that, that sense? So we could look at it, but it, it, in discussions with providers that I have, which is on a regular basis, it's not their top priority in terms of those elements of terms and conditions that we could, could work on. So certainly salary is there overall, and we're trying to do what we can with, with salary, and we'll have to see how that works out um, following the 1st of July increases. Certainly fuel costs and, and transport costs is a is an issue, making sure that people have got access to good um, support management opportunities for career progression. And sometimes those gaps in the, in the day are an issue. So we will have a look at how, you know, providers could better structure the work. But yeah, we could look at pensions as well. But certainly when, when I do talk to them, it's not the first thing that, that's on their, their list. Uh, and, and on their wish list that we could try and improve. Councillor Hunter, then Councillor Hall. Thank you. Mine's up more on the care homes. Uh, it does say in uh, 24th of May there was 236 vacancies and 130 are in nursing homes. Do we have a variety of vacancies? Because yes, there's care homes, there's different needs. We've got an aging population and again, as home can close at any time as the struggle to get staff and situations change. It's how we can try and leave that person as local as we can, but still meet their needs. It's a case of just, you know, there's a difference between just a, a care home and dementia, and there's many different complex needs as to how we've got vacancies of all varieties across the board. Yeah, um, it's a good question. I think there's one area where we operationally we we would like more provision for people with very complex dementia and that that i say would, would, would be our, our biggest gap we've just commissioned a, a new service for um 12 beds for people with complex uh, dementia and we've had to do it in in gateshead uh, we did a tender exercise in in amongst our northumberland providers and none of them tended for it uh, at that point in time. So it's it's currently operating in um, Gateshead. So we're doing some work with the market to try and uh, encourage our local market to deliver that kind of service. So if there was one area where I think we were most under pressure, it's a complex dementia. But having having um, a, you know, I would say those two hundred and thirty six are around the county. Um, so. We hope not to have to move people too far if the worst happened. And we are talking about if the worst happens yeah. here. Uh, it's good that we've got a fairly even split with, with a nursing offer in there. As I say, it's challenging um, challenging needs around people's complex dementia. Chair, I think it's maybe something we need to review in the future, the, dement the dementia and the needs. I think somewhere along the line. Yeah. Thank you, Phil. I've got one more now. I'm conscious of the time because Adam's got to be somewhere else. So, Colin, you're the last one. Thank you. One of, one of the things that is highlighted at 6.9 is that if we transfer services in house, this puts a financial burden and risk on the council. That is not the priority of someone living with a terminal disease. You don't count the pennies or the cost. What they want to do is live the best quality of life that they have in the limited time scale that they've got. And one of my concerns is that we depend more and more on hospice and other charities to provide services where we fail to provide adequate services through retention of staff to contractors or whatever. And what I would like to know is what is the cost of provision at home to the council by the installation of the necessary equipment in a timely scale compared in a home that is not suited, but the only alternative, taking them from the family and taking them out of their area to give them the care that we cannot 
provide a tool. Uh, I mean, the, I couldn't answer the question and got the, the detail of what specific equipment and things that people will need, but I would think overall we would generally try and support people into their own home before moving them into a uh, a, a residential setting that would be our preference and, it, and that is generally what families and individuals want as well what we can do it that would be what we time so home adaptation would be a priority as opposed to cost for care home is what I'm trying to establish we've got yeah we've got funding that's available for disabled facilities grants for example, to try and um, adapt people's homes to keep them at home as opposed to into, a, into an older person. Means tested. Thank you. It's means-tested, of course. There is means-testing, but we also have, uh, if you wish to enter into this here, a discretionary power. Instead of relying on charities. And I'll just park it there. So if you've got specific cases, then I'm happy to have a look at those as well. I was just going to say, can somebody can you speak to um, Alan outside of this meeting? Yes, yeah, that would be better because the so situation is based on our later council and is the yeah. situation is being looked into. The council are holding this regret, right? So what is being looked into? How's that done? Yeah, the last one. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, my experience recently. It with two elderly people is that they will go to the end of the earth to keep them in their own home because the the, the cost of the care home you know you're kicking off a thousand quid a week type thing you know you're, you're, you're talking of large sums and for the individual and one of these has got dementia it, it's all about them feeling in the same place and remembering where things are it wasn't it's not about all oh, you know, yes, there might be relations or get rid of, you know, that type of thing. But the, the whole thrust of everything I've picked up over these last few months is that they will move heaven and earth to keep uh, residents in their own home, in their own environment, because that is where it is best. Obviously, there will come a point with everybody, all of us, we get there, where we've got to say, oh, well, you know, that's up, I'm going in. But I've first hand experience where they've done that level best to provide this, to provide that, to make sure and to have the care. Uh, and it, it's not an easy job when you work with people with dementia at all. So, you know, just a point. Yeah, we actually do it, so we know exactly what it's like. Right, Alan, can I just thank you very, very much for that report. Uh, brilliant. And uh, I know you've got issues off the door, but just once again, thanks from the committee. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on. Um, it's the forward plan and work program. First, it's the over to you. Thanks, Rep. Um, I'm going to take forward plan and work program page. That's why I'm just going to go to the two that is on the agenda. And um, before I do that, something that I'm going to explain some of the images that we've made to the way we present the forward plan and work program. Um, you know, previously the board plan was a document that just filled the decisions that were coming to cabinet in the in the future. And um, the plan with the new forward plan is to look at the decisions that have been made since the last time the scrutiny committee met, and the decisions that the cabinet will be looking to make, and um, hopefully in the long term future. The idea behind having the two sort of forward plans that gives members more of an opportunity to look at um, items for post scrutiny so members can look and see what cabinet have uh, decided and we can look at either the implementation or perhaps at the forms of the decision and then the future forward plan which is very similar to the one that we've always had will be there in case members wanted to get involved in the policy development and other things well in advance of it going to the cabinet and we're hoping you know all five, six months before it goes to cabinet, not just about a week or so before time. So that's why the forward plan is different to the way that normally does. And we will start to consider it at the same point as the work programme 
plan for that at the start of the meeting at a new state and then the work program towards the end. Um, so with that, I suppose all the remaining questions on the different forward plan. Mm -hmm. uh, in that case, it's the work program and um, I'll take away the committee's comments today around um, carbon data and bring some of that back, back from the future. Um, and the pair of cousins are not best for the business committee informed of the work that's going on with that. Um, the annual coroner's report, which was the book into this meeting, will be considered in September. And I am talking to Newcastle about their oncology services. So the Newcastle came and did their quality accounts in May. There was some concern around the waiting times for cancer. So I started speaking to Newcastle about having them come back around the 6th of March, which would be November, and to talk to us in more detail about their, their cancer wait and the work that they're doing. So that is on the work programme for November as a provisional date. And but hopefully I'll get a date confirmed for that soon. Um, that's all I wanted to say on the work programme and the forward plan, unless members have anything about that. Yes, just have we got any dates yet? Are we still monitoring it for the follow up with the dentistry and also the ambulance service? So, the ambulance service I'm talking to you about um, their availability of data. Again, when they came to the authority accounts, there was questions around the level at which they provide data in the locality. And um, we need to discuss with me as how we do that because they, they're saying that it's quite resource intensive to get localised data and uh, so we need to find a way of being able to get the data that it's and needs um, and the dentists I will speak to my interest in about their dentists to come and give us an update and um, especially in light of some of the, the anecdotes that we've heard about um, local cases. I mean we, we always um I think what's the right word. We always sort of invite people to come. We have a and build a good relationship and are not be too aggressive. But in these cases, with the Northeast Ambulance Service, that's just simply not the case. And um, I discovered that when I put the Freedom of Information request to say TD1 by postcode, and some girl in the FOI department went on the computer and got it up quite quickly. I think she might have had some, some words said to her because they can believe that it's a, a very obvious thing to pull off a spreadsheet. So that simply not being honest and transparent. I think we need to push back on that. A dentist situation, we've had a situation where, and Chris, you've been very good, where we have been uh, trying to pull off with the, and just haven't had a, haven't had any responses whatsoever. And they've, they've sat and told us, haven't they? And they said, look, there's, we're struggling with the regular appointments, but somebody's in a really bad situation with triage and everything, you know, they will be seen. And we've had some, you know, a very useful case study of a uh, woman in an appalling situation, could afford to go private and just couldn't, literally could not get a dentist. And they wouldn't get back to us. And so that was just what they said to us. And I think we really, in these cases, need to push our back because it's in the public interest, isn't it? And if they're bobbing us off and not being pretty transparent, we need to, you know, just tell them that's just not acceptable. And that's our, our job. We don't like to get, you know, but if we need to, we need to, because that's our job. I would agree. I mean, obviously, yeah. we've been um, very involved with the dentistry stuff. And um, I think it is about keeping it on the agenda, especially now as it's transferred across to the ICP. Um, um, as you know, it's, you know, it's what <laughs> it's coming, it's come up, yes, it has come across. Mm -hmm. So, I think it, it is worth just keeping it on the agenda because I'm sure those conversations are being had, but I think it would be good to have those conversations, including you know, patients really, because they're the ones that you say yeah. that are frustrated and in pain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. 
Just building on Derry's point, I do agree it is about keeping it on the agenda and uh, Pamela Phelps, who has been on a local um, ICB contact for primary care, has just picked up um, a, a regional rule in relation to uh, dentistry, pharmacy, optometry, optometry, <laughs> make that what you will, um, but um, that's a really good link for us, but there may be something for yourselves as scrutiny to think about that more regional wide scrutiny because this is a um, national issue to regional issue to, to local issue. Issue. So there's something about about progressing that that uh, conversation maybe um, from local to certainly that ICB level. We we have three three members of this committee who sit on the regional joint mosque, right. which oversees the ICB yeah. um, for the region. So I will put, I'll, I'll speak to those well, four members because um, it includes the chair of health and wellbeing board. I'll speak to those four members, and it can be something we'll refer to the, the joint mosque as well to the world program. Mm -hmm. Is a different subject. Um, water. Uh, there's been a lot in the news lately of Thames water, and which sparks a question for me: um, Do we ever get Northumbria water in here for a bit of drilling? Because it's, you know, at the end of the day, we all have a tap. And it out comes Northumbrian water. Yeah, but then there's the fluoride question: Where are we with that? Because that was high up on an agenda not that long ago. All I'm saying is, that is it time that we plan to look at water? Uh, because if what is true that Thames Water is borrowing so much money and nearly insolvent, I would like to know before we get there with Northumbria water. And I will check the technique's terms of references and see if you something like that would fit with. Might be discussion how the chairs go. Yeah. Well, I think it's it's it, it, it's in the it's in the domain. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I can see the health side of things. Um, so yeah. Yeah, I can't I can't respond in relation to water generally, but in relation to the community water fluoridation, you'll note from the the minutes of the Health and Wellbeing Board when we took our latest oral health strategy update. There was also an update in there in relation to the um, to the national changes of um, legislation around the consultation for community water fluoridation schemes going back in totality to the Secretary of State. Um, they are pursuing what that consultation would look like for us within the North East, having got to the point of being deemed operable and efficient for the Northumberland's expansion and indeed the Durham um, expansion scheme as well. So um, we are um, we are minded to wait for um, Department of Health and Social Care to inform us when that consultation will be led, but we will be uh, part of that as and when it happens. So it's something to keep on, on the radar because our local scrutinies would absolutely be critical for, for, for that, ideally with, with support. So. Thank you very much. Les, just one more. Yeah, one from that, uh, which is a good point. Um, can we have a look at uh, the dental um, services it were throughout the county to see if it is improving uh, from the last well, report. I think this is what Councillor Hale was on about yeah. in the dentistry back in here. Yeah. That's what that's what's been talked about. So it's going to be put on the agenda. Okay. Okay, thank you. Right. Um the Manine, any urgent business that's not been noted. Okay. And, sorry. Uh, I think at this point, can we recognise the 75th birthday of the NHS <laughs> and how marvellous it is? Exactly. And I, for one, and I suppose many of us in this room are really pleased that it's in operation. Totally but I will quote this. There was a young boy born in uh, 1954 on the 13th of October, and he owes his life to a Canadian doctor who came to Newcastle to work for the NHS, which was a marvellous organisation. He wanted to be part of the, of the early days of the NHS. And I thank that of Dr. Then I'm here today. <laughs> well said. Thank you. We all, we all, <laughs> all recognise the NHS as a valuable um, presence. We really do. And me more than thankful to the NHS over the last 12 months. Did you say that? Did a mere partner's job. 
I think you shared birth with Margaret Thatcher, didn't you? <laughs> I'm sure you're delighted about that. <laughs> can we just can we just finish this sleep note? That's on a good note there. Thank you for that, Lynn. Um dates of future yeah. meetings. Um there was listed on, on the agenda, but the 5th of September, um we want to be able to move that one to the 12th of September. Can we agree that one? I agree. That's, good. That's a joke. That and so what, it's, what it's for is because then we'll have the new chair of the uh, health and wellbeing. So that's why we want to be able to move it to the end because then that person can chair the health and wellbeing. Okay? It's good, you chair. Right? Thank you very much. So is that the great first? So I'm happy with that. Are we, uh, so that meeting, are we going back to one o'clock or what two o'clock? One o'clock. So that concludes this meeting.